why don't we go ahead and kick off. Um, I know some people are still going to be joining us, but we'll go ahead and get through uh, our welcome and introduction. And those folks who are coming in can um, join the program when they log in. But hello and welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Matthew Patterson. I am the Director of Education at Mocha Jacksonville, and I would like to thank you for joining our program this evening as a cultural resource of the University of North Florida. All of our programming at the museum is in support of our mission, which is the discovery, knowledge, and advancement of the art, artists, and ideas of our time. Part of how we achieve that is through offering programs such as this, which allow our audience to engage directly with artists and academics working on the edge of contemporary thought. If you enjoy this event, we hope that you will consider becoming a member of Mocha Jacksonville. Members are our biggest supporters and allow us to host free events such as this. Members also get free admission to the museum year round, special rates on programs and classes, invitations to exclusive events, free downtown parking and more. For more information, you can visit our website and just click on the link or click on the support tab or send an email to mocha membership at unf.edu. Of course, if you are a student or staff member of the university, you're entitled to many of these member benefits, including free admission to the museum during any of our open hours. Uh, we will have time for questions and answers at the conclusion of our program. If anyone in our audience has a question throughout the discussion, please feel free to enter it into the Q&A function at the top of your screen. And we will help to answer those questions. Uh, and now at this time, I would like to begin our program by welcoming our guest, Dr. Scott Brown, Professor of Medieval Art History at the University of North Florida, as he presents his lecture, Monumental Thinking, the Past, Present and Future of Monuments to the Confederacy. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I have to say it's a, it's a great pleasure for me to be here with you today, particularly as Matthew points out, as a medievalist uh, speaking to an audience at a, a contemporary art museum. Uh, these are extraordinary times. They continue to be extraordinary times. And I can't wait to, to meet you all down at MOCA soon, uh, but for the time being, uh, we'll make do with Zoom, uh, for which I think we all have to be grateful, although I'll point out this is my fifth hour on Zoom today, and I'm starting to feel a little bit of what they call Zoom fatigue, I think. But I want to thank uh, MOCA, and I want to thank UNF uh, for sponsoring this lecture tonight. And uh, I want to thank you all for being here for what I think is an important uh, question, um, a discussion of an issue which is very present and very much about the art and ideas of our time. What we have seen in the last year, a kind of extraordinary turn of events in terms of the nation's relation to the past, uh, in particular its relation to the past through the monuments that we have built that dot the American landscape and that bear their ideas about the past and history forward into our present and thus make them for better or worse, contemporary. We have at the museum right now, a pair of exhibitions which help to inspire this talk. Uh, two really quite extraordinary exhibitions. And I will say that if in these pandemic times you are still not going to museums uh, which is perfectly understandable. We have a wonderful new point of access at MOCA, a, a virtual tour which the museum has constructed, which allows you remotely to visit and access and, and really engage quite richly with many of the materials on exhibition at MOCA right now. And I'll ask Matthew to, uh, to give us a link in the chat uh, to MOCA's uh, virtual tour tool, which is really quite extraordinary. On that tour tool, right now you can go and take a look at the current Project Atrium installation, which is this really spectacular work by the artist Carl Joe Williams. I mean, it's, it's awesome. <laughs> it is just fantastic. Three stories of brilliant color and geometry and artifacts and symbols and narratives, stories. The work intersects, as you can tell from the title, with the ideas of our times, that is the idea especially of the last year of uh, making great lives matter. The debate that we have currently going on in this country, the urgent question about the past, our understanding of the past, the legacies of racism and inequality of the Confederacy 
and of uh, many of the material remains that shape our society in the wake of those legacies. Carl Joe Williams' work is just a riotously spectacular, immersive work. It's one that we don't hesitate, I think, to describe as monumental. In fact, it's a work that calls into question the meaning of the word monumental. Because in one sense, this is certainly monumental. We use the word monumental to, to refer to things of scale, of size, and this filling a monumental entryway uh, in the atrium at Mocha, three full stories, is in that sense unquestionably monumental. But in another sense, this is anti-monumental, this work, uh, because monuments have not only to do with notions of scale and size, they also have something to do with the idea of durability, of permanence. And the Project Atrium series at Mocha, if you're familiar with it, is just the opposite of that. It creates anti-monuments. One of the most wonderful and charming things about Project Atrium at MOCA is that every three months or so it turns over and every new work replaces one uh, before it. And the works designed for this installation space are unique. That is, they are commissioned for this space. They exist only within this space and will never be seen again in the same way. That is in itself the idea, the opposite of the idea of a monument. Monuments which are like great anchors dragging the bottom of history and resisting change. Carl Joe Williams' Making Great Lives Matter is just the opposite. It is dynamic and it galvanizes our attention at a moment in time to its presence in our space in contrast to monuments, which we often quickly forget about and ignore. Uh, wherever you're from, there was probably a monument in your hometown that you hardly knew was there. They're there, permanent, enduring, but unless something compels us to pay attention to them again, they're also dead and inert. And until they obtain a new meaning for us, they lack any sense of urgency like this wonderful piece. So in one sense, Carl Joe Williams' work is monumental. It certainly reflects, as monuments do, on the past. It engages with ideas of history, with the idea of what it is that makes America great, what the American dream is, how American lives are lived. And in that sense, it's deeply historical in some of the ways that monuments are. But as I say, in other ways, it is an anti-monument. The other exhibition currently at uh, MOCA that engages with some of the same themes is the just opened exhibition of works by the artist Jeremy Dean, which is monumental in another sense, not in the sense of scale. In fact, most of the objects in this, uh, in this exhibition are small chunks of stone and, and uh, uh, little uh, 19th century and 20th century photographic bifolios like we see here. But Dean's work is monumental in a very literal sense, in the sense that it employs fragments of an actual monument, that is chunks of the foundation from the Confederate monument in St. Augustine's Plaza de la Constitution, which was removed last year in August, 2020. Dean uses these chunks of, of concrete and tabby stone from the foundation of this Confederate monument. In fact, the earliest Confederate monument in the state of Florida. He uses these chunks of the foundation of the removed monument as pedestals, as foundation stones for these ephemeral images uh, of lives that otherwise are unrecorded, undocumented, and unremembered. One of the wonderful tensions in his exhibition is this tension between the durability, the permanence of the stone monument, which carves history in a certain way and privileges it by raising it up on this pedestal, held against the lives of people whose names are forgotten, whose homes no longer exist, which were ephemeral to begin with. The stories that attach to photographs 
a photograph mounted on cardboard, this fragile document and record of an unremembered past, gives us a new kind of monument, a monument to the ordinary, a monument to the individual, a monument to the forgotten. It's quite a, a, a powerful collision of the Confederate monument fragment, this relic, and this other kind of curio, this archival uh, reflection on a past that we scarcely recall. It is a very, I think, uh, compelling conjunctions. But it is this reference to the monument and to monumentality that drives the tension in Dean's work. And it depends on this monument from St. Augustine itself. The, the giant obelisk weighing many tons, which was removed in August 2020, which stood just outside of the old slave market in the Plaza de la Constitución in St. Augustine. The slave market, which we see pictured in this old photograph, bearing the caption, Florida, the land of flowers and tropical scenery. What a cruel irony. Mounted here on top of the foundation, which bore the obelisk, which stood right outside of the slave market for so many years in St. Augustine. There's a powerful and a, a difficult poetry in this combination of objects. The obelisk that provided these stones for Dean's exhibition is this one. It is the Confederate Memorial Obelisk, the earliest Confederate monument in the state of Florida, erected in 1872 and standing here in the park at uh, St. Augustine, the Plaza de la Constitución, since 1879. And it is uh, a monument that, as I say, was removed in 2020, not destroyed, but relocated onto private property at the Trout Creek Fish Camp outside of St. Augustine. It raises the question, as Dean's exhibition does and as Carl Joe Williams' work does, the question that's currently in our society that is uh, roiling uh, debate in the public sphere about monuments and about the past, about how we treat the past, how we remember it, how we memorialize it and commemorate it. It strikes at the very heart of this debate about the future of monuments, a future that is debated in every city in the country practically, but certainly across the South in every place that is home to the ubiquitous Confederate monuments that dot the Southern landscape. The debate is unfolding here in Jacksonville too, which has its own monuments. One located immediately outside our museum in the old Hemming Plaza, the old Hemming Park, now James Weldon Johnson Park, and another mere blocks from Mocha Museum in Springfield Park, formerly Confederate Park until August, 2020. Dean's exhibition, Carl Joe Williams' work, the monument in St. Augustine and its removal raise this question that, as I say, is roiling public debate about the future of such monuments. We debate their removal, their destruction, their recontextualization, their transformation, their reinterpretation. And these questions are important questions, but they are, they're also very difficult questions, partly because unless you're an art historian, most people don't spend a lot of time engaging with monumental thinking. Monumental thinking, the topic of our talk today, is really uh, its own kind of thinking. Understanding monuments, which have a difficult temporality, they are both products of the past that reflect on an even more distant past, but in ways that are often false and obscuring. And then they bear their meanings forward into our present, so that works of monumental stature are almost always simultaneously ancient and contemporary. The Confederate Memorial Obelisk at St. Augustine was removed quite suddenly. But don't cry for St. Augustine. They have plenty more obelisks to go around. In fact, uh, the Plaza de la Constitución was home to three monumental obelisks until the summer of 2020, including the much older Monumento a la Constitución 
1812, installed in 1813, which is actually a Spanish monument commemorating the Spanish constitution of 1812, a constitution which gar guaranteed certain liberties and freedoms to the people of the Spanish empire, including to black and enslaved citizens of the empire. Spain had a very distant, different system of slavery. And in fact, um, uh, blacks and Africans um, enjoyed many more freedoms under the Spanish uh, 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 constitution than they did under the later American constitution. We have these two competing obelisks then standing mere meters, uh, yards apart from each other both commemorating distant uh, ideas uh, about American history, a Spanish constitution, a Confederate United States, institutions of slavery that dis differed in texture and flavor, but nonetheless uh, were equally offensive to our modern notions of freedom and of equality. The obelisk itself is a prototypical monumental form it's a giant hunk of stone, which by its sheer size is, is resistant to change and resistant to destruction. And its association with ancient Egypt, practically the oldest human civilization, uh, is this association with eternity and the ideas of the eternity of the soul in Egyptian afterlife. Obelisks in American art and architecture, almost always like the Washington Monument, are intended to commemorate something that should be seen as everlasting and perpetual. And so here we have two monuments, profoundly ironic monuments to a, a Spanish constitution, which obviously did not endure. In fact, less than a decade later, Florida was uh, no longer a Spanish possession. And uh, a monument which is a retrospective vision of the Confederacy, a country whose existence has always been officially denied by the United States of America. Two monuments to the past, to pasts which were never realized or which came swiftly to an end. Nevertheless, the monuments remain. There is, however, uh, as I say uh, about the, the monuments of, uh, of St. Augustine's Park, uh, nothing to mourn because there is nothing more natural, in fact, than the destruction, the removal, the transformation of monuments. We tend to think of them as objects that, that preserve history and thus ought to be preserved. We tend to think of them as reminders, but the truth is that Monuments do not preserve history. They often erase it. And, and the other truth is that they don't remind us of much because usually we've forgotten what they're about, <laughs> as we'll see in this talk. Uh, there is nothing more natural for monuments than destruction, removal, transformation, reinterpretation that shows little respect either for the ideas that they intend to commemorate or for the motives that the builders had uh, in producing them. Here we see the obelisk in St. Augustine's Plaza outside of the old uh, slave market in the center of the, the plaza, being boarded up in preparation for removal. And then under cover of night, uh, the trucks came in and hauled the great thing away on the back of a giant uh, truck to be reinstalled if you want to go see it, I suppose, at the Trout Creek Fish Camp on private property. There's nothing unusual in this. In fact, it's not even the first time that this monument was moved. It was erected in 1872, but not moved to the Plaza de la Constitucion until 1879, an act which we have to see as a, re a very intentional repurposing of the monument. So early in its history, it didn't signify what people wanted it to signify in 1879 in its original location. I think the act of moving it outside of the slave market was a very powerful act of reinterpretation of the obelisk itself. As I say, removal of monuments is hardly uncommon. In fact, it is extraordinarily frequent. We can think, for instance, in Eastern Bloc countries after the fall of the Soviet Union, the removal of all of the statues of Lenin and Stalin, of, of uh, Karl Marx, 
Here, a giant statue of Lenin being carted away in much the same way. Changes of regime, changes of religion often yield destructions and removals and suppressions of monuments. As here we see in the painting of the triumph of Christianity in the Vatican halls, in the Sala di Constantino, the image of the cross, which rises atop the pedestal, which once bore the pagan statue, which now lies shattered in fragments on the ground. Little love lost, few tears shed over the fate of the pagan idol. Or we can look closer to home and closer in our own history, to Washington itself, to the city of monuments here in our American landscape, where the redesign of the National Mall in the early 20th century resulted in massive destructions of monuments that already existed in the monumental landscape of Washington, of monuments to so many diverse people that that we hardly remember uh, their significance or their place in history. And certainly the erasures of their monuments is not something that we are reminded of by the, by the monumental National Mall, which looks to us as though it must have always been there and always have been planned in this way, which is hardly the case since it wasn't until the 1930s that the mall began to take shape, removing and destroying the parks and the statues that already stood in its path it seems that uh, with the obelisk of Washington looming over the landscape, things have always been this way. In fact, on the edge of the mall and Lafayette Circle, the equestrian statue of Andrew Jackson, uh, very famous of course in our local landscape, uh, the earliest equestrian statue in the United States of America, one of the first major bronze works to be produced in the United States, a work of great historical significance regardless of what we think of Jackson, it too was almost removed. It was slated for destruction at one point in the early 20th century. Not because people had any problem with Jackson. They didn't care much about him, to be honest, in the 1920s, but because the statue itself seemed to people out of date, old fashioned and in the way, which is a reminder that uh, in fact, it's not just regime and political and religious and ideological change, but changing taste and changing needs for space, which dictate often the practical motive for removing monuments, which happen to be in our way. There are several points I want to make through my examples tonight, uh, one of which is uh, to begin monuments themselves, which we think of as preserving history. Monuments erase history, as the great uh, art historian Kirk Savage, a historian of, of monuments in America, has written. Monuments erase history in a very practical and obvious way. That is, whatever was there before they came along is gone, erased, eradicably from the landscape. And often we find in the American city uh, scape that monuments are built on top of sites which are simply not given credit as being significant. In the city of Charlottesville, where the statue of Lee, which was the focus of violence in 2017, was built on top of an old African-American neighborhood, making way for a monumental space without acknowledging the things that were destroyed. This is often the case. Uh, monuments don't tell us about what was there before. Monuments erase history. And in fact, oftentimes they obscure their own histories. Uh, this is the case here in one of the most famous places in Paris, a place that will be iconically familiar to many of you, even if you've never been there. Although it doesn't look this way today, this is the Place Vendôme in the center of Paris where in the late 18th century, a monumental colossal equestrian statue of Louis XIV, the Sun King, stood guard over the city of Paris, destroyed in 1792 in the French Revolution. And there arose in its place in 1810, the famous Vendome Column, which was designed to honor the triumphs of Napoleon Bonaparte. There's little sign that ever there was a statue of Louis XIV here. The new statue of Napoleon looks eternal. It reprises the shape of the column of the Roman emperor Trajan and, and projects this image of 
of eternality to us, giving little evidence that there was anything there before. But the Vendome column itself was a target uh, very quickly in its history, very soon after its completion of transformation and reinterpretation. The colossal statue of Napoleon, which stood atop the statue, atop the column, was in the early 1820s after the, uh, the fall of the Napoleonic Empire and the rise of the, uh, the, the new French kingdom, the restoration, uh, the statue of Napoleon was removed. In its place, a simple flag was placed atop the column in the 1820s. The bronze from the statue of Napoleon was taken and melted down and used to make a statue that still stands in Paris of the first Bourbon monarch, Henri IV, which stands near the Pont Neuf in Paris. This monument too erases its history and obscures its past. There's little sign or little indication that it's an act of violence against another monument that was crucial to its birth and creation. Thereafter, people felt bad about taking Napoleon off the top of the column. And so a new version was commissioned and mounted on top in the 1840s uh, and then stood guard into the 1850s and 60s until 1871, when the communards in an insurrection in Paris, the commune, uh, pulled down the entire column smashing the thing in the Place Concorde as captured here by the artist Gustave Courbet, who was a commune art himself and lobbied for the destruction of this monument. That's a wonderful irony, an artist proposing iconoclasm. The column came down, smashing in the courtyard, utterly destroyed, captured in a number of iconic views here, the shattered fragments in an early photograph lying broken on the ground, the statue of Napoleon once again dethroned. So how is it that there's a, a grand column uh, in the Vendome Plaza today uh, that looks identical for all that we know to the one that was destroyed? Little indication, little sign, little reflection of this complicated monumental history uh, survives here today, which is to say that monuments erase the past. Each of the subsequent, each of the preceding phases of the history of this plaza is obscured by the presence of its latest incarnation. They erase their own histories, in fact, and it's very rarely the case that we recall very keenly the circumstances that brought any particular monument into, into being. They seem in our present space eternal and insurmountable in their monumentality, which is certainly hardly the case. Which leads us to another point here. Uh, my second point tonight is that the reminders uh, that monuments, uh, we believe that they are constructed to convey are in fact soon forgotten by us. Uh, we ignore the origins of monuments often. We are quick, we are quick to forget them. And uh, we generally uh, are alienated from the circumstances that brought them into being. So if we tend to think of monuments as, as things that preserve memory, we have, to, uh, we have to think more critically then about what memories it is that we think they preserve. This is a marvelous little church portal in the south of France, an obscure place in the Pyrenees, Oloron Saint Marie, which was built around the year 1100. And it's a place with a marvelous story to tell, although it's not very forthcoming. The monument itself doesn't tell this story in any particularly clear way. It is a doorway filled with religious iconography, including in the central sculpture of this tympanum over the doorway, uh, an image that depicts the descent from the cross, the story of Christ's body being lowered from the cross and prepared for the grave. Here, his mother, the Virgin Mary, receives the first hand which has been detached from the cross and is about to be lowered to the ground. In the early 20th century, early 21st century, around the year 
2000, the French government was performing restoration work on the doorway of the cathedral, just firming up old stone, which was corroding. And they removed the slabs of the tympanum to protect them so that they would not be damaged during restoration. A good example of the ways in which we prize preservation of monuments and the effort to preserve history and memory. What we discovered though, on the back of this slab of sculpture when we lowered it from the tympanum was quite extraordinary and totally unexpected. On the back of this statue of the Virgin Mary is a pagan idol of the naked god of war, Mars, the Roman deity of war. This sculpture on the back of the 11th, 11th century, 12th century sculpture is in fact a much earlier ancient Roman sculpture carved in the fourth century CE. The reuse of this example is a wonderful precedent for us in the, the current and contemporary debate about reuse, recontextualization, transformation, adaptation of monuments of the past. We've long done that kind of thing. When the Christian builders of the 12th century came along to this site, they found a cathedral in ruins and a city which had been devastated by centuries of war. And lying amongst those ruins, they found a pagan idol of the god Mars, an object which they would have probably described in their terms as demonic, as evil. And they took this thing, this potent symbol of the destruction of the past, and they mounted it inside the wall of their doorway and affixed on its obverse face, a carving of the Holy Mother of God, the Virgin Mary herself, the antithesis in every way of the pagan idol Mars, a life giver rather than a death dealer, a woman rather than a man, a chaste virgin rather than a profligate soldier. Uh, it is clearly an intentional reuse we don't have to go far outside of this example to find other examples of this in medieval art where the stones of ancient Rome are reused upside down, transformed, recarved to nullify and transform their ancient pagan potency and, and to make of them something new, something reusable in the landscape of medieval, uh, medieval life. Which leads us to yet another point, which is that we ignore the meanings of monuments. We don't often actually know very much about them. Neither are we very curious about what they actually mean because we're generally more content to make up our own meanings. And this is part of the challenge of the presentness of monuments. In the Renaissance, a few hundred years after our cathedral that we just looked at, people were digging up pagan idols left and right and rather than destroying them or burying them, they were digging them up and putting them on museums, putting them on display. The Vatican halls are lined with statues of Venus and Mars today, as we see here in these images from the 16th century, which capture views of antiquities resurrected from the past. The charm of antiquities in the Renaissance, of course, is well known. One of the most unusual and famous examples is this sculpture, which was unearthed in the late 15th century, a battered hunk, a fragment of stone set up in the Plaza Piazza Pasquino in Rome in the early 16th century. It's so obscure, it's so damaged and so broken, it's hard to imagine anyone wanting to display or to reuse this, but it is today one of the most famous monuments in Rome. It uh, was so obscure that people simply made up what it was about. We know today that it was probably a fragment of a group like this, depicting Odysseus supporting the body of Achilles, as you can see the similarities. But in the Renaissance, they had little idea uh, initially that that was potentially the subject. This fragment, this monument, became the focus of an annual celebration sponsored by a cardinal of the church, Olivier Carafa, who set the monument up himself and sponsored an annual poetry competition in which the statue was given a new identity every year. Here we see in 1515 that this statue known as the Pasquino is now transformed into Orpheus. And the idea was that all of the humanists and scholars of the city would come and write beautiful poems about Pasquino as Orpheus and give voice to this battered fragment of the past. 
Without any respect, of course, for what the monument originally meant, no one cared about that at all. In fact, we rarely care about what monuments originally mean. We're more interested in creating and cultivating their contemporary meaning, as in this example. Or for instance, in 1526, where Pasquino took on the mythological identity of Argo. This is not so very different from St. Augustine, where the Monumento a la Constitución of 1812 uh, was uh, in 2015-2016, the inspiration for uh, a year-long exhibition of reproductions of the obelisk, which uh, called Obelisk Art 450, took this Spanish obelisk, a monument to the Spanish crown and constitution, as the opening for a, uh, an exhibition about themes of democracy, strangely enough. We can see here in one example, the monument has uh, uh, reinvents this obelisk to Spain as a commemoration of Spanish, of, of uh, Floridian statehood. 1845 old glory brings democracy to Florida with the 27th statehood. Uh, we might say that for many of the citizens of Florida, this was a tragic event. In fact, statehood in Florida and uh, the, uh, the, the rise of American influence in Florida led to the exodus of many uh, free blacks in Florida who fled for Cuba, where their rights were still protected under the Spanish constitution, which was replaced by the American one in 1845. What a strange reuse of history, one that disagrees in every historical way with what we understand to be the sense of the original monument. But as I say, we rarely respect the sense of the original monument as we, as we can see in, in the, the dressing up of, of Pasquino as Orpheus and Argo, the composition of text to commemorate this new identity. The story of Pasquino is even more interesting than this. The tradition of writing poems and publishing them every year began to inspire a new and subversive tradition Pasquino began to be known as what's called a speaking sculpture, sculptura parlante, uh, and uh, uh, the speaking idea is this idea of him speaking in the voice of the poetry, the poems composed in his honor. A young men, critics of the Pope, began to sneak into the Piazza Pasquino at night and post epigrams, poetic compositions, as you see here uh, uh, on the surface of the Pasquino, in mocking and satirical terms, in oftentimes scatologically profane and perverse terms, criticizing the Pope and the leaders of Rome. And so this monument of official beauty of discourse and poetic form became a monument of subversive counterculture. Uh, the Pope was so incensed by the use of Pasquino in this way that he set guards around the piazza at night to prevent people from posting new epigrams which led the miscreants to go and find other monuments in Rome to speak on their behalf. And Pasquino acquired a brother, Marforio, across town. Uh, and people would go and post responses to Pasquino in the voice of the statue of Marforio, as we see here uh, with inscriptions that record the poetic voice of Marforio. Now these, I should point out, are, are not authorized uses of these monuments. In fact, um, the posting of epigrams and the graffito that's associated with, with the statue of Pasquino with this publicly critical and satirical voice is far more like we saw in the year 2020 with the wonderful uh, uh, energy around monuments across this country, a violent energy, but nonetheless a dynamic and powerful reinterpretive energy as here in uh, in um, uh, Richmond, Virginia, at the site of the monumental statue of Robert E. Lee, which over uh, the days of protest in 2020 began to acquire this rich message, this graffito message, this reinterpretation uh, as a work of art at odds with both its originary meaning and with the official contemporary meaning that we attribute to it. The Pasquino is a perfect model for this. And the behaviors that we saw in 2020 around monuments, the iconoclasm, the acts of adaptation and transformation, these are as ancient and timeless as monuments themselves. And a fully normal, a fully, a fully traditional way 
of dealing with the challenge of monuments in public space. This, I think, is one of the most extraordinary images and works of art to come out of 2020. And I think we have to think of it as a new and independent work of art. In fact, uh, uh, this wonderful overhead shot of the statue of Robert E. Lee reminds me in some ways as nothing so much as Carl Joe Williams' brilliantly colorful uh, and, and, and dynamic compositions in Project Atrium at MOCA today. And this brings us here to my final problem, the problem of the presence and the presentness of monuments. And this is what's really driving our debate today. Generally speaking, we're tremendously content to ignore the presence of monuments, to fail to notice them. Uh, many of you have probably never visited this monument in downtown Jacksonville, a few blocks from our MOCA Museum. This is the crown jewel of Jacksonville's monumental landscape. It is a monumental sculptural installation today in Springfield Park, formerly Confederate Park, formerly Dignan Park, designed by one of the foremost sculptors of the American 20th century, Alan George Newman. And it is known uh, by a number of names, including Florida's tribute to the women of the Confederacy, installed in 1915, commissioned in 1914 in downtown Jacksonville. It is a monument whose presence is a challenge, as all monuments are uh, a challenge, in the simple sense that it takes up space. One of the things that monuments rely on is their inertia. They're big and they're hard to move. Uh, this is an enormous granite and marble structure of bronze sculptures. It's not simple to move it. It's not simple to change it. Monuments are designed this in this way to resist efforts to change. We can strap the statue of Lenin to the truck and move it, but it is easier said than done. And it risks costing enormous amounts of money, which is a very practical concern for us. This monument, which was commissioned in 1914 at a cost of $25,000, over $700,000 in today's terms, is itself a, a really valuable investment in the aesthetic landscape of our city. Whether we approve of it or not, that's the fact, is that it represents an enormous outlay in terms of both the initial costs and the annual costs of maintenance, which we have expended on the park and on its monument in years since. To remove it would probably cost nearly as much. Uh, it raises the question about, in a society of scarce resources, how we respond to the, the intolerable presence of intolerable monuments. What is this monument about? That is the problem of its presentness. For most of its history, we've been content to ignore it. Most of us know little about it. Few of us have probably seen it in person. It is a monument whose presentness is now at stake, however. Uh, we are aware of it. The mayor is aware of it. Many uh, concerned citizens, both on the pro and the anti-monument side, are aware of it in ways that they were not before. But as I pointed out, we really know much about the histories of these monuments. We know little about what they replaced. And likewise, we are alienated from the intentions of the founders. One thing that monuments can never mean for us in the present is exactly what they meant to the builders who conceived them. Instead, we are engaged in inventing meanings. We're making up meanings about them. This monument commissioned in 1914, installed in 1915, has a plaque that purports to explain its origins. It was established in a park which already existed, Dignan Park, it was known, named for the founder of the park, the first uh, officer of public works in the city of Jacksonville, Peter Dignan, who was not a native Floridian, but a Michigander who emigrated to the city and rose in politics until he was appointed postmaster general of uh, North Florida, an important political position at the time. Peter Dignan and his success caused a backlash in the city of Jacksonville. Little known story, uh, the rabid anti-Catholic um, proselytizer Billy Parker, a Jacksonville citizen at the time, began preaching on the street corners of downtown Jacksonville against Peter Dignan, who was not only a Michigander but a Catholic. And Billy Parker 
was angry about him. He was the editor of an anti-Catholic magazine, The Menace, which purported to describe the secret invasion of American society by foreign dark-skinned Catholics who were coming to take over uh, and transform American life. He, pro he proselytized against Peter Dignan after his elevation to the Postmaster General, and he caused such a stink that in 1914, after the, uh, the Baptist uh, state governor, um, a park Trammell, came to town, that the, that the city voted to change the name of the park to Confederate Park, uh, erasing the memory of Peter Dignan at the same time that they erected a monument that erased the park he had designed. The monument itself is tremendously ironic, however, because it's full of Catholic imagery, which I wonder how that would have sat with Billy Parker, who was only a few years later shot to death in a gin joint and gambling hall here in town. Uh, a fascinating little piece of local history. But the monument that was designed for this site, uh, the monument to the women of the Confederacy, is itself uh, full of Catholic imagery. This is the bronze statue, which is the centerpiece of the work, which stands here on an altar-like pedestal. I say altar-like, but we might as well go ahead and call it an altar, because that's what it says on the inscription on the thing, uh, which refers here to the noble women of the Confederacy of the South, uh, who the women of the Southland, I'm sorry, who sacrificed their all upon their country's altar. There is another confrontation here that we have to address here. Uh, we have to confront the, the fact that here there is an obvious erasure. This is a monument that proclaims itself a monument to the women of the Southland, but erases many of the women of the South, and in particular, the African-American women, who are not represented in this monument in any way. We might be tempted to think of this monument as a, 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 a necessary counterweight, a, an important counterweight to monuments to men in war. What about the experience of women? But I think we should be very cautious and skeptical of that view because in fact, this monument um, has a kind of religious passion for the idea of the Confederacy itself. It's less about women and more about men's image of what women are for symbolically, as we can see when we investigate the image of this woman. The entire monument is designed as a ciborium. A ciborium is a religious shrine which stands over an altar, as we can see here in the medieval church of San Ambrosio, with the baldachin standing over the ciborium, standing over the altar. So our monument has a ciborium over the altar enshrining this image of a woman who herself is closely modeled on Michelangelo's Pieta, the famous image of Mary holding her dead son. The very similar con compositions, the very similar tones of the image connect the image of our woman to the concept of the Pieta, that is to religious piety. What is this woman's piety toward? It is toward an idea of the Confederacy. She holds on her lap a book. At her side, two children. It's a composition that recalls other religious images of the Renaissance, including Raphael's Madonna of the Goldfinch, where she holds a book of scripture in her hand, the Virgin Mary, while John the Baptist and the baby Jesus stand beside her, her arm protectively wrapped around them. The image of the pious mother, the faithful mother, the mother uh, nurturing is also present in this image. Uh, the conventional image, the iconography of charity is given to us here in the painting on the right by Andrea del Sarto, to which we can also compare our picture. The image of women with books is strikingly common during this period in American monumental history. And here we have a Union monument from 1884 in Waterbury, Connecticut, designed by George Bissell, which represents the figure of emancipation. Her name is right behind her head. She is a Union monument, not a Confederate one, but she is a useful guide for us in understanding the symbolism of our monument, emancipation. But the woman herself is conceived of as the federal government, the United States government, holding the book of history and American morality with two children at her side, much as in our composition, including a well-dressed white one who stands uh, high at her knee and a shabbily dressed 
African ragamuffin who holds a hoe in his hand and kneels at her feet, a union monument and even an abolitionist monument, but one which is obviously inheriting and perpetuating the in inequalities which are uh, uh, still manifest in our society today, even in a work of art which takes in its own idea of itself a broad-minded and liberal and progressive view of race. In this image, the book is the book which conveys what it means to be an American citizen. It's the book of truth. It is the book of history itself. As we can see in another similar monument from the 1930s outside of the National Archives in Washington, DC, we should be wary in American monuments of images of women with children at their knees and of women with books. But this monument speaks the truth to us about the meaning of our own. We have only to look at the inscriptions on the pedestals the heritage of the past is the seed that brings forth the harvest of the future, says heritage. What is past is prologue, says future. And that is exactly what our monument means. There are in fact a number of these monuments to the women of the Confederacy similarly conceived of women with children and books who are telling the story of the Confederacy to a new generation to bear the sword of history and to rise to battle again, to defend the principles of the South, that is to defend the legacy of slavery. As we see, there are many of these monuments. There is even one which I'll conclude with in my own hometown as a personal story. I should tell you, uh, I grew up in Macon, Georgia, just a few blocks from this very site I must have walked by this monument a thousand times as a kid. It's right in the center of downtown. And I was shocked to learn of its existence. I guess you could say I always knew there was a monument there <laughs> and I must have seen it a thousand times, but I never knew there was a monument there. I didn't know that that monument showed what it showed. When 2020 brought its crises of iconoclasm and reinterpretation and removal and destruction, I became interested, of course, in these monuments. And I, I reconnected with the monument of my hometown, which is one of the most interesting, one of the most telling. It too has a woman with a child at her knee. She holds not a book though, but a spindle and spinning wheel at her side. She's dressed al antico in the garb of a kind of uh, imagined antique, ancient, classical attire. She's not a woman of the Confederacy, although this is a monument to the women of the Confederacy. She is instead a mythological figure. She's Penelope from the Odysseus story, from the story of the Odyssey. Penelope is the wife of Odysseus. And while Odysseus is gone on his incredibly long journey, and when he seems to be dead to everyone else in the world, Penelope is still at home waiting and believing faithfully, faithfully waiting on the return of the man lost at war. Every day she spins and every day she unweaves her spinning because she is declaring her own intention to, uh, to remain faithful to her husband. She won't remarry, she says, until she finishes her weaving. And this image as she raises her son to respect the lost father and to grow up to replace him is the image itself of the lost cause, which is embedded in our monument as it is in this in Macon, Georgia. The removal of other such monuments, including in our own city, where the naked column stands in front of Mocha without its Confederate soldier, calls into focus, I think, the very important and very difficult question of how we respond among the many options open to us, removal, destruction, reinterpretation, transformation, adaptation. But there are many recipes in history, and uh, I look forward to seeing how our conversation develops. Thank you also very much. I look forward to taking your questions. So please send them to our um, Q&A window. I have the first question here. 
I'm curious if you think there is a connection between uh, palimpsests, particularly in the form of manuscripts, and many of these monuments you've described this evening. There's certainly a different experiential quality between manuscripts and monuments, but I'm interested in the layer and the practice of erasure, layering, and recognition. Uh, well, this is a good question. Uh, I have to confess I, I'm not entirely uh, sure how to um, how to respond to it, except to say that, you know, there are some analogies that we might um, that we might make, I guess, uh, between palimpsests and manuscripts, and and these ideas of erasure and layering, recognition that I've that I brought up in our monument today. But there's a fundamental difference for me, which is that manuscripts are very intentional objects. Um, that is, uh, that um, uh, they're written to be read and, and we can access them only by reading them. When they're closed, when they're on the shelf, they're out of sight, out of mind, and we don't engage with them. So engaging with a manuscript is a, an incredibly deliberate act. One of the challenges that we face with monuments like these, the Confederate monuments in our public space, is that we don't have the option of ignoring them. Uh, I mean, we do, we ignore them all the time, but they're there, we have to walk around them, we have to navigate them, they take up space, we have to maintain them, uh, we have to cut the grass around them. Uh, they are, uh, they're, they're objects that we don't have the option in the same way as the manuscript of engaging or not engaging. They're there permanently, always on. And that's part of the, the challenge of recognition and that environment with the monument constantly exposed in public space it's astonishing, it's striking how we fail frequently to recognize them. Uh, uh, that is that they, we see them without seeing them as I did my monument in my hometown, uh, not really knowing what I was seeing, the eyes passing over it. When we engage with monuments in that way, as we often do, uh, it's a very different kind of experience from reading. We don't read these monuments, we don't look closely at them. Uh, we might read the texts on them, but when we talk about reading a monument like ours, there's also the iconographies, the sculpture, the book, the children, the woman, the altar itself, the ciborium in which it's housed. Let's see. Why Southland and not Confederacy on the Jacks Monument? Now, that's a wonderful uh, question, a wonderful point. One, Southland is, uh, is a way of euphemizing the Confederacy, as if to suggest that there is a monumental Southland. Uh, one of the last monuments I showed is a monument to the women of the Confederacy in Baltimore, Maryland. Maryland was not a state in the Confederacy. It never left the Union. There's something bizarre uh, and really erasing about this idea of building a Confederate monument in a Union state. And we have something of the same idea by calling this a monument to the women of the Southland. It's a monument that denies uh, that there is anything other than a monolithic woman and a monolithic Southern woman. When in fact, what we're dealing with here is an image of a white woman and an image of a white woman reflecting on a very narrow concept of, of the past. Uh, one that is not held broadly by anyone. Um, uh, that idea of the Southland, of universalizing and totalizing the women is a way of both pretending that this monument is to all women, and also a way of pretending that all women are reflected in the identity of this figure. And that's my understanding of it. All right, well, if there are any other questions, I would be delighted to take them. Any final thoughts? Looks like we have one coming up here. Um, comment on thoughts about the construction of counter monuments or new monuments adjacent to existing monuments. You know, as I as I said, I think there's a, a rich history of this uh, counter monuments and uh, um, new monuments that adapt and transform uh, our monuments uh, that ex that are already existing. The um, there's a tremendously long tradition of it. Uh, so the best example I can think of is the one from 2020, that fantastic series of projections on the Lee statue in Richmond. It's just really uh, fantastic. I mean, it's just marvelous. 
recreates that monument. The Lee Monument in, in Richmond is slated for removal now, but I almost treasure its presence with that astonishing tapestry of graffiti on its foundation and the rich projections and the focus of it as a re-envisioned, a repurposed monument. I think that in itself is one of the most powerful monuments that I, that I can think of. It's what I would call a, a counter monument in many ways. But we can also take the example of Pasquino, which is related to it, in the way that Pasquino, uh, which was this authorized and, and official kind of monument that promoted a certain vision of art and beauty in the past, and the way that it was taken and transformed against the will of the authorities to say something completely different. This is also um, you know, a, a possibility. And then we can think of in many places where new monuments ad adjacent to existing ones or sometimes built on top of old ones or reusing parts of old ones uh, exist. Um, there is no simple recipe for what is cleansing. We can take the example of our uh, cathedral with the idol turned into the wall and recarved on one side. Uh, that's a marvelous example as well in many ways that is uh, suggestive to me of, uh, uh, of one way that a community navigates this idea of contamination and of uh, the, uh, the abomination of a thing in its presence in space. Would that work for us? Uh, I don't know. We have very different notions of, of, of cleansing and of execration and of, of uh, consecration than people did in, in the Middle Ages. In fact, that's an important question for us in our deeply secularized society. Is there anything that is re-consecrating for these monuments which are so objectionable? Is there anything that is that can force us to tolerate, that can compel us to accept the monument in a new form, cleansed, reconsecrated, transformed, adapted. That remains to be seen. So far, the, the most common solutions have simply been removal, often uh, as in Jacksonville under cover of night, uh, or in the case of St. Augustine, by transferring the object to private ownership, which I think, personally speaking, is an absolutely terrible way to dispose of objectionable objects in public space. Giving uh, a, a bad thing a new life in a new place hardly, uh, hardly answers the problem that it poses by its presentness in society. The status of the monument in Jacksonville mentioned at the end is, uh, well, I mentioned too, there's a statue in Hemming Plaza, formerly Hemming Plaza, James Weldon Johnson Park, which has been removed uh, by the city and is in storage somewhere without firm plans for its future. Meanwhile, the monument here in, in downtown Jacksonville in uh, Springfield Park uh, is, um, uh, there are no plans at all for how to address this at the moment. There are discussions and uh, discussions, in fact, that I have been a part of and that MOCA has been a part of, uh, discussions that have considered all of the many things that we've talked about and I think that's an important part of the process is simply learning about the history of these things and engaging in monumental thinking to think about the future of them. It, it seems like a simple solution just to remove it. But I wanna emphasize again, one of the challenges that these monuments pose is that they represent a history of real investment, hundreds of thousands of dollars. In fact, at this point, uh, if we calculate it, millions of dollars have been expended on the construction, the maintenance and the preservation of this monument. And it would be $600,000 simply to take it down, leaving a hole in the Jacksonville landscape, a hole that we may not want filled at the moment by this thing, but I'd far rather see three or $4 million of direct investment in Springfield in one of our most underserved and, and most unappreciated uh, historic neighborhoods, then I would see another $800,000 spent on this damn thing, uh, I guess is what I would say. Uh, I have several, I see several uh, questions actually in our, um, our, our chat as well. And, um, and the current monument is, in, is wrapped in plastic. And, and that's true, it is wrapped in plastic because it's already been a target uh, for removal or, or for attack uh, by people who are against it. Uh, I will say that uh, it, uh, like many monuments, uh, has had red paint thrown on it in the past. And the, 
the, the covering of it is currently there to, to make it less of a target and also to protect it waiting on the future conversation. So again, we are at the end of our talk. And I wanna take the opportunity again to thank Mocha, to thank you enough, to thank you all for being here and for engaging with this important question. Go see the museum, go see these wonderful exhibitions. If you can't get to the museum itself, take a look at our virtual tour. It's a, it's a marvelous new tool that brings you right into the space and actually gives you uh, a, a tour experience in a way that, that you can't have in the real space. Until we are all back there again, I will see you all at MOCA. Meet me at MOCA. Take care, everyone. <laughs>